Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. And, Jim, we start with the good. And if you just paid attention to the Washington, D.C. press corps, you would think that voter ID is one of the most fiercely divided issues out there and that the Obama Justice Department is fiercely fighting for something that at least close to 50 percent of the American people think would be really discriminatory against certain people in this country if they forced them to present a photo ID at the polls. But the statistics point out that that is simply not true, and it's not even close. Hat tip to Ed Morrissey at Hot Air for uh, pointing out this Gallup poll, 80% of Americans favor voter ID laws. According to Gallup, 80% favor it, 19% oppose. Republicans, 83% photo ID requirement, 63% of Democrats. Jim, that's almost two-thirds. And so this whole idea uh, that this is somehow disenfranchising or a political hot potato that the Justice Department just has to keep getting involved in, Simply not true. Americans want fair elections, and this makes it very clear. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things where the, the fervence, the vehemence, the intensity with which Democrats fight on this issue makes you think this is not about them worrying about some sort of little old lady who doesn't have some sort of form of ID. Uh, down in South Carolina, for example, they said, look, if you don't have ID, we will provide it for you. We're not going to charge you. This is not a poll tax. This is not trying to create some sort of ridiculous burden on people who want to vote. We just want to verify that you are who you say you are. And as a result of that, we just, you know, if you, we will cover the costs if you can't afford it, if you can demonstrate poverty or, or something like that. We just want everybody to vote once. And that seems like that would not be such a reasonable request. They keep insisting that, oh, this is, uh, this is ridiculous. This is an effort to suppress the vote. That for some reason, African-American citizens and other groups are incapable of going out and getting ID. Obviously, most of them do. Uh, Obviously, the vast majority of them do. So we're curious about what's going on here. The other thing we we keep throwing at this is say, oh, this is a solution in search of a problem. Nobody's ever proven that an election has been stolen. Okay. But I believe it was back in 2004, and I I cite this article pretty frequently. And it's kind of fascinating how much it just doesn't permeate when you bring this up. Um, The New York Daily News did an investigation and found that 46,000 New Yorkers were registered to vote in both the city uh, of New York and the state of Florida. Now, you may recall in 2000, Florida was, you know, the election came down to 537 votes. Uh, and then they went through this list. And look, a lot of these people, a lot of people in New York have summer homes down in Florida. They spend their winters down there. OK, fine. <clears throat> maybe they registered to vote. Maybe they moved from one place to another. And so on and so on. But they found that between 400 and 1,000 registered voters voted twice in at least one election. That's a, a violation of federal law. Now, does this mean that elections get stolen all the time? No, but it means it's a legitimate concern. And the vehemence with which Democrats fight this and and are resisting public opinion on this, it's the sort of thing that would make a curious mind more than a little bit suspicious uh, about how they see this issue and why they seem so strangely uninterested in making sure that everybody who votes shows ID to prove they are who they say they are. Jim, come on, though. Florida, has Florida ever had an election that was decided by between 400 and 1,000 votes? I mean, Yeah, Florida's always a landslide. (laughs) Here's that it isn't. By the way, Greg, I'm looking at this New York uh, Daily News article from 2004. I know it'll stun you. Of the 46,000 people who are registered in both states, yes, 68 percent were Democrats, <laughs> percent were Republicans, 16 didn't claim a party. Now, now some of these Shocking. folks are saying they, they, of those people who are registered in both uh, asked for an absentee ballot to be mailed to their home in the other state. So maybe you're you're going to be in Florida in November, but you really live in New York, so you ask for an. There are circumstances in which it's not voter fraud and something sinister. But in these cases where you're voting twice in one election year from two different addresses, hey, that's a crime. So the lack of interest in certain authorities in this certainly does uh, raise giant red flags. Yeah, a couple other points here Uh, in this poll. You might think that, well... Yeah, the numbers are lopsided, but what about those who might be most affected by this? What about non-whites? Yeah, 77% of non-whites favor voter ID, so that argument won't hold water either. Interestingly, though, Jim, 
Eighty percent of voters also favor early voting, including 74 percent of Republicans. Maybe it's just a personal bugaboo with me, but I personally hate the idea of early voting. But interesting that those numbers are almost identical. Well, as someone who has traveled, I'm going to say like three or four of the last five or six election days, I see the value of it. I see absentee balloting. I want to have relatively uh, laid back rules about that. Look, some people, maybe your, your car is going to break down that day or something like that. Uh, if you're willing to, in my mind, if you're willing to go down to the polling place early, this is not something nefarious. And as long as they're checking the ID and you don't vote twice, fine. I do think, I believe in some of the states, early voting starts in September, which means it's like before the debates in right. some cases. <laughs> yeah. You know, your October surprise, you know, one of these days we're going to learn something, which, oh my goodness, he was, you know, running that harem out of his other property or something like that. <laughs> And you'd be like, oh, wait, I can't believe I voted for that guy. Well, too late, you know. So there is something to be said for waiting till late. I think a limited period of early voting strikes me as uh, no major threat to democracy. We can make some concessions to people who uh, uh, may have little obstacles arising on Tuesdays. I believe it was at the, the Virginia primary in 2008. There was like this giant ice storm. Oh, yeah. That's who are trying to vote. So th- things happen. Um, but I think you're right that the early voting can go really extensive and out of control. All right, on to the bad martini now. And uh, Jim, if there was any issue that vaulted Donald Trump to the front of the Republican pack, in addition to the fact that uh, his personality was larger than life and then all sorts of other things, a lot of free media, it had to be his position on immigration. We're going to build the wall. We're going to deport uh, the people who are here illegally. We're not going to play the games anymore. We're going to do what's right to protect our country and have American citizens have the best access to jobs. We're not, they're not going to get uh, undercut by those people coming into the country illegally anymore. And a lot of people obviously responded to that issue. But Donald Trump now has canceled an immigration policy speech in Denver. And uh, after a meeting with some Hispanic figures uh, from Hispanic organizations over the weekend, there's been some rumors that Trump is kind of uh, watering down what he plans to do on the issue of immigration and what to do with illegals currently in the country in s- specifically. So he went on the O'Reilly factor on Monday night. And there's two different clips here. First of all, it took him a while to get to uh, answer O'Reilly's question about whether he's changing on uh, illegal immigration. The first cut, uh, not as bad as the second. Uh, here's the first one. We're going to obey the existing laws. Now, the existing laws are very strong. The existing laws, the first thing we're going to do, if and when I win, is we're going to get rid of all of the bad ones. we got gang members. We have killers. We have a lot of bad people that have to get out of this country. We're going to get them out, and the police know who they are. Getting rid of the uh, criminal offenders who are here illegally is certainly something most people would like. And Jimmy's right. There's a lot of people who are concerned that the amnesty deal that Reagan signed in the mid-'80s came with the amnesty, but it was also supposed, supposed to include a lot of border security provisions that never bothered to get implemented. But it's the next clip that is getting him in the most trouble here, uh, particularly from folks who uh, would like to see uh, quite a bit of change in how immigration policy is implemented. As far as everybody else, we're going to go through the process. What people don't know is that Obama got tremendous numbers of people out of the country. Bush, the same thing. Lots of people were brought out of the country with the existing laws. Well, I'm going to do the same thing, and I just said that. So there you go. The plan for the illegals who here who aren't uh, hardcore criminals, Jim, is to do exactly what George W. Bush and Barack Obama have done, although he did say later he's going to do it with more energy. So I guess a lot more hand gestures. <laughs> As he talks about this. You know, Greg, this is why I'm such a cynic on this issue, because we can look at at Trump's history and say, wait a minute, you know, okay, you got the allegation they used workers from Poland in in the demolition to prepare for Trump Tower, but that was a long time ago, okay. And then you can see all the legal immigrants who he hired to work at the golf courses and resorts and stuff like that. He's like, look, I'm just taking advantage of the laws and stuff like that. But if you you were a little more skeptical of, of Donald Trump, you would not see him as the most natural guy to be leading the fight to deport uh, illegal immigrants and, and all of these things. And you look at Mark Krikorian, uh, head of the Center for Immigration Studies, a guy who you'd think would be a Trump guy. Uh, it didn't take very long for, for Krikorian to figure out. Trump was not really looking at this issue in the great detail. And basically, while he liked what he was hearing from Trump in certain areas, he didn't have a great deal of faith that Trump would carry it out. Well, score one for Krikorian and score one who everyone thought that Trump was going to flip on this uh, and that he would not, you know, uh, uh, hold the line on this. He's now, you know, sounds very different. Look, everything Trump is saying is literally true. Yes, in 2012, we really did uh, have a high number of deportations in this country, 419,000. Now, 
whether you could sweep up the 11 million in a year or two, uh, we can debate about that. But if you can take out, you know, 400,000 per year, most Americans would probably think, okay, you're going to feel and you're going to see the impact of, of immigration enforcement at that level. Of course, in the second, Obama's second term, lo and behold, the number of deportations have, uh, have declined. Uh, Kerkorian can point to a lot of arguments to say the deportation numbers are kind of overinflated and exaggerated. Folks who get turned away at the border and things like that. But how, at its heart of it, do you remember, Greg, when, when Marco Rubio was open borders? Sure. The accusation that, you know, every, everybody who was not Trump was allegedly open borders. Now, Rubio defenders would say, hey, wait a minute. He's always believed in border security. The difference was he believed in an eventual path to either citizenship or path to permanent residence, path to legal status. What Trump is proposing, we're going to take out the bad ones. Okay, how about all the others? And how does he define the bad ones? All right, you know, if you if it was only violent criminals, because the argument from a lot of folks who were immigration hawks was not just oh that they're all drug dealers and rapists. The argument was they were taking away jobs that should be that Americans should be doing, <laughs> and they were creating a drain on the welfare system. They were creating a drain on schools. They're creating drain. You know, these are people who had vi- violated U.S. law and were beginning to get the benefits of America without following the rules. And now Trump's kind of like, nah, never mind, forget all that stuff. And this is one of the reasons you don't nominate someone who has no record, who has never had to make these decisions. I wish I could, like, feel sympathy for all the immigration hawks who chose to believe in Trump, but the signs for this were very clear from the beginning. There's no reason to put faith in this guy. And now at this point, the question is, uh, which part of his contradictory plans do you want to believe in? This is another reason you should nominate this guy. And if there are a lot of folks over at Breitbart.com or uh, VDare or places like that, who are awakening and, and just, you know, their faces are flopping down on their cornflakes this morning. Some of us warned you. Some of us pointed this out. Some of us, you know, suggested that Trump was not really the immigration hawk that he was posing on. And here we are. And so uh, I guess the question now is which which version of amnesty do you prefer? <laughs> which version or the Trump version? I wonder remember, what... remember, you know, angry Trump fans direct all criticism to Greg Corumbus <laughs> at RadioAmerica.com. I wonder what the Coulter and Hannity explanation is going to be here. My guess is, is that he's saying what he needs to say. Uh, to, to maybe get elected, and then then what he said before will be the real policy. You think that'll you be the explanation? You on me. <laughs> I'm the one he truly loves. <laughs> All right, on to the crazy martini now, and it's double-barreled, although we're going to spend a lot more time on one barrel than the other. There's a big debate going on now. Who is the bigger liar? Is it Ryan Lochte or is it the Rio police? And it's a dead heat. We're headed right to the wall there in the pool, and actually it might be the Rio police who ends up being the bigger liar here, uh, USA Today actually decided to investigate the details of the Brazilian police report. So kudos to USA Today. Seven days after an incident that will in part define the Rio Olympics, details are becoming clear about what happened during a gas station encounter between four U.S. swimmers and security guards. And not everyone has concluded Ryan Lochte and his teammates are entirely wrong and in the wrong or that the account offered by Rio authorities is entirely accurate. A narrative of the night's events constructed by USA Today Sports from witness statements, official investigations, surveillance videos, and media reports <coughs> supports Lochte's later account in which he said he thought the swimmers were being robbed when they were approached at a gas station by armed men who flashed badges, pointed guns at them, and demanded money. A Brazilian judge says police might have been hasty in determining the security guards by how they dealt with the swimmers did not commit a robbery. A lawyer who has practiced in Brazil for 25 years says she does not think the actions of Lochte and teammates Jimmy Feigen constitute the filing of a false police report as defined under Brazilian law. An extensive review of surveillance footage by a USA Today sports videographer who also visited the gas station supports swimmer Gunnar Bence's claim that he did not see anyone vandalize the restroom, an allegation that in particular heightened media portrayals of the four as obnoxious Americans behaving recklessly in a foreign country. Meanwhile, Rio authorities have declined to identify the guards or offer any details beyond confirming they are members of law enforcement who are working a private security detail. And later they have an eyewitness in here who says that one of the police slash security guards did, in fact, show a badge and draw guns. So a a lot of confusing things here, Jim. (laughs) Obviously, nobody's telling the whole truth. Uh, So a a lot more egg on the Rio police face as a result of this because they were so high and mighty last week, and it turns out they were pretty sloppy in this as well. Yeah, and let's not forget NBC News, the main, you know, the the network of the Olympics, uh, which basically had a vested interest in making the Olympics look good, maybe airbrushing out some of the uh, glaring problems in Rio. Uh, Al Roker and the whole gang on on NBC, they tore into Lochte when they thought Lochte was lying. I hope that they will at least give Lochte his due. Now, 
This is not a three martini lunch podcast endorsement of going out in Rio and getting really drunk <laughs> with a bunch of your buddies and urinating in the, behind a gas station and getting in trouble. Look, we're not saying Lochte is a saint, and clearly the initial version that he told people uh, does not line up precisely with the events. Having said that, from Lochte's you know position of, of what has now been verified and what you know, admittedly in a drunken state of mind, it's entirely reasonable to think that he thought he was being held up by these. Uh, uh, by these individuals who, oh, by the way, I understand they're like prison guards who are moonlighting. Yes, uh, Greg, and that that doesn't even give off. I'm, I'm sure they're moral <laughs> role, role models right there, right? There's there's no sign these guys could possibly do that, or that Lochte could think he was being held up by these individuals. I'm sure they're they're the finest of police work with their uh, guns drawn and things like that. Greg, do you think, you know, I think even in North Korea, they don't draw guns for public urination. I mean, you want to talk, you know, RoboCop will even kind of give you, you know, just a bad <laughs> glance at that one. But, uh, so, Brazilian cops, they're on it. So, uh, for those of us, we, we kind of rip, you know, this is the lighthearted ending crazy martini segment that has come back to haunt us several days in a row. <laughs> Mr. Lochte, we're sorry. We hope you uh, get some of your endorsements back. Um, you obviously, don't go out drinking in Rio. Wait till you get home and, and you know, do that. Um, but, uh, again, you know, the Rio police and Rio is, looks like it's got a, uh, you know, the image has been tarnished a little further since, uh, very little of what their, their version of the story is, is verified by the known facts. Well, Jim, somebody's going to take your advice. Uh, as we go to our second part of the crazy martini, I can guarantee you who won't be going out late drinking in Rio. That would be the entire Russian Paralympic team banned from competing in the Paralympic games next month as punishment for the country's systematic doping program. The International Paralympic Committee's blanket ban on Russia is in sharp contrast to the earlier decision by the IOC to allow individual sports to decide whether Russians can compete in the Olympics. In the Olympics that just concluded, uh, the track and field team from Russia was banned, but uh, other sports let them compete. So doping the Paralympics, Jim, there's nothing the Russians won't stoop to. Let me just observe, if you're really cynical about the International Olympic Committee, uh, you could look at this and think, look, the, the, how likely is it, Greg, that Russia decided to dope all of its Paralympic athletes, but none of its Olympic athletes? <laughs> oh, no, no, that would be wrong, comrade. We're not going to we're not going to have you, you take any of those steroids or anything like that. No, 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 no. <laughs> Only let the paralyzed athletes do that. In, the, in that light, the idea that, you know, the IOC, look, we're not going to take the Russians out of the game. That create a lot of bad blood, no pun intended. Uh, but we're going to come down hard on their Paralympic team. We, we know how all the big endorsement money is in there, right, Greg? <laughs> right. We'll show you. That's where we are right now. So, uh, you know, catch that Paralympic uh, excitement spirit. And, you know, uh, for everyone who, who believed that Russian athletes were the epitome of, of fine judgment and good, uh, uh, good sportsmanship, their Russian dreams have died. If they had just cracked down on Ivan Drago back in the day, this wouldn't be a problem <laughs> anymore. He was obviously juicing, and he still lost. Yeah. It's because he can't beat Americans like Rocky. That's right. He didn't. The Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> By the way, the Eye of the Tiger, one of the performance enhancing supplements that the rest of the <laughs> Very good. Very good. Jim, on that bizarre note, we'll call time for today. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to tune in again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.